So, Ara, congratulations on the film. I know that it's been in Sundance, it's been in Berlin, it was in Edinburgh this week. Mm -hmm. It's finally going to get released in the UK on the 1st of September, so very close. Mm -hmm. um, but the, obviously, I think when you were making this film, or what, certainly when you were thinking about conceiving of this film, it would have, I guess, been during the pandemic period, which yeah. obviously was a period where everybody was confined and they weren't able to go out and spend time. And this is a very kind of film about intimacy and being together and closeness. And I wonder whether that was an influence on, um, on, on, on the project. Um. Yes. <laughs> uh, I just also want to say it's amazing and wonderful to be here at the BFI. I just walked through the lobby and I just was like, I want to go to Ozu. I want to go to Serpico. <laughs> well, I want to go to a re-release of Gregory's Girl. You don't know how lucky you are. It's an incredible place. So um, it's really nice to be here. You're uh, always welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, w when the pandemic uh, was going on, uh, many, many feelings that many of us had, but, but for me, I was really not certain when it was over if, if film would exist, if movies would be made, and particularly um, a kind of movie that I really crave, which is, a, is one of intimacy, a kind of film in which the actor is, is put in front of everything, um, what they do, what they share, the, the liberty with which um, they, 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 sh they are in the film and the film is made. Um, and also a film, um, the kind of film uh, that, that I love, which is their films about and for adult people. And I feel that there's a kind of disappearance of that kind of film, at least within American cinema, that I, I didn't know if it would exist. So that was my intention. I then wanted to make really a film of pleasure. I think I, think I I craved that as well, and um, I cast these three actors, and in every sort of moment of creating the film, we thought about what is um, the most cinematically pleasurable way to tell this story and with these, with these people. And you, you, you have co-written many of your films with Maurizio Zacharias, mm -hmm. who um, you did with this film as well. How, how does that work in a kind of, uh, in terms of, are you both in the same room hashing it out, or I mean, how, how, how do you work well, through that? This is the fifth film we've made together, um, and we've we've created a, a pretty um, regular practice, which is involves with the two of us meeting for a couple of months, talking about characters, talking about other movies, talking about our lives. Um, in this film, we had seen a movie called The Innocent, which is the last film of Visconti. And um, it's about an aristocratic man, so a man with a lot of power who has a mistress and a wife, um, and he's not sure which one he wants, and it becomes a sort of uh, a love triangle battle of, of desire among these three characters. And we um, were drawn to that structure, and um, so what we do is we create an outline together, we create a series of scenes and characters, and then he goes off and writes the first draft. Um, which can sometimes take five or six months. Um, this, the process after that is really the film becoming mine. I write the last draft, but also I include the things that I discover in the making of the film. So the cast becomes the film, the locations become the film. Things like the bike, bicycle scene didn't exist in, 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 the, in the script until I was in Paris and saw what a crazy bike rider. Franz Rogowski was, and <laughs> thought, oh, that's interesting. So um, it's a process of it being ours, his, mine, I would say. And when you're going through that process, are you thinking at all about casting, or is that something that comes strictly later on? Uh, no. Usually there's someone who works for both of us as a kind of muse. Um, in this case, I had seen Franz Rogowski in Mikkel Hanukkah's film Happy End. Um, and particularly, I mean, he's incredible in that film. He, he plays a supporting role, but he kind of takes over the screen. If you haven't seen the movie, I really recommend it. But if you don't feel like seeing the movie, I recommend going onto YouTube and watching uh, Franz in a, uh, go YouTube, Mikkel Hanukkah, Happy End, Sia's Chandelier, <laughs> which is a song by Sia that he performs a karaoke uh, moment it, with. And he's just really, um, He's a, he's a being of cinema in a way that excited me, and so I wrote the film for him. Uh, the other two actors came once the script was finished. But did you know that he would do it at that point, or did he, did he, was he brought into it later on as well? No, definitely not, um, which is fine. I've done that before, and sometimes it works out, and sometimes it doesn't, but really the person has inspired a character. Um, in this case, I sent the film to Franz after I'd finished it. Um, I did not tell him. I had written it for him until he agreed to do it, and then I said, oh, by the way, 
I wrote that for you. Um, because there's a lot of burden. There's a big burden if someone says, oh, look, I love you so much, I've written you a film script, won't you please, please yes. do it? So I try strategically to not approach it that way. And when, you're, um, when you've cast a film, obviously all three kind of principal actors, mm. um, you're requiring a kind of level of intimacy and trust, I guess, between them. How do you kind of go about establishing what their kind of their boundaries are and working with them on those kind of, well, the more intimate scenes? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, I have two things that come to my mind about that. One is, if you ask Adele Exarchopoulos what, what the most vulnerable moment in the film is, the scene that was the scariest, the hardest, where she felt it most exposed, it was when she sang in the film, because um, she's not a singer. Uh, I don't rehearse my films before I start shooting them. Uh, I spend time with the actors. We go through the script individually. Never have they said any of the lines in advance. Um, there's always a feeling of kind of, um, there's a possibility for something great to happen and there's also a possibility for failure in every scene. And in that moment, she'd never sung before a crowd before and suddenly there's a crew and there's Franz Rogowski and, and I think all of that is in, is in the shot, really. Um, but that being said, in terms of the sex scenes, there's very direct questions about what actors are comfortable with and what they're not and when they set the boundary, I don't, that's it the boundary is set, and they each have boundaries. And then it's a process of um, figuring out where the camera is, um, trust existed um, between these actors, but a lot of it is improvisational um, to the extent that those scenes are, are written but not with words, right? Like they're actually incredibly well acted because they tell stories. Each sex scene is very different than the other. Each one has a particular kind of um, purpose in the film and in and, and a way if I got in too close and tried to choreograph every moment you wouldn't have what you saw so it's an interesting balance and it becomes one of trust certainly and I, I, it's interesting that you don't rehearse with them beforehand mm -hmm. um, so how, so how because obviously that they need to kind of build up some sort of rapport and they need to build up that kind of that trust themselves. So how, how does that work? Is that just something literally on day one they're expected to? No, I mean, we spend a lot of time trying on clothes um, together. And the clothes are is, striking, aren't they? Yes, but, but I, I really mean that. I mean, and, uh, the clothes are something that is very central to the creation of character, particularly when I'm asking them not as individuals necessarily to transform. Um, I'm not looking for transformation. I'm looking for someone to show up, bring themselves, listen, know their lines. Um, but the costumes and, of course, the script also gives them character. But a lot of what you're seeing is this sort of toggle between Tomas and Franz, Agat and Adele, Ben and Martin. Like, you, you're watching both. And I think that's the kind of cinema that I'm interested in making, and I think that's what people sign on to, to do with me. Did that answer your question? Yeah, I got it, lost. It, yeah, no, no. It, 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 I mean, yeah, I mean, it does in terms of... Um, uh, because obviously, you know, we have to believe that they've been in a relationship for X number of years and that... Well, I will say that actors have a really... I, I sometimes think it's like ecstasy. Um, not that they're on ecstasy, but they assume and not create a, a kind of history very quickly because they need to. So they know what needs to take place. I, um, with Ben and Franz, we met in Paris. They had not met each other. The three of us sat down at a cafe in Paris, and in five minutes I said, see you later. And I left them for two or three hours, and they shared bits of their lives. And it, it's like a first date, but a date that already has a marriage. And so, um, you know, they're interested in getting to know each other. Also, I'm casting people who I believe will have a sensibility, and also particularly a performance style that is in line with each other. And I look for actors who um, you can't really see the work they're doing, but somehow they're able to elevate it to, to something um, that's not ordinary. Like, it's a realist film, but it's also a non-realist film. And I think all three of these actors do that quite brilliantly. Yeah, no, they do. I mean, I mean they're extraordinary performances, aren't they? Um, and I think that because I think the characters have so many flaws in them, that they're, um, they're, they're very believable. I think, you know, often when you have, you know, characters where, obviously, you know, I, I guess it would be easy just to kind of concentrate purely on, on the director in, in the film 
uh, Thomas and just think mm. that he's a kind of a, an evil character. But actually, they all they, they all make mis- they all make mistakes. They're all making they also very all, selfish decisions. They also all assume power in different yes. moments, and they take power in different moments. I have to say, there's like I'm very sad that Ben Whishaw is not here, and he and and he would be, but he's on strike, so he's not able to be here. But um, it's strange because this is his town, and and, yeah. and he would love to be here. So um, I, I speak for myself, but also with appreciation from Ben. And, talk, and talking about, about towns, obviously some of your films previously, New York has been a, a very integral part of, yeah. of it. Not all of them, obviously, um, <coughs> frankly not. But with this, with this film, obviously Paris takes on th- th- this role. And I wondered how it was filming in, in kind of with so much the UK, the, on offer in a sense and, and, and how you would dress that. Um, obviously preparing in America, but then obviously having to come over and, and, and film in Paris. Uh, you know, I, I, I spent um, many months in Paris, so I, I felt like I was preparing in Paris, and the crew was all f- um, French. And, and I first lived in Paris in 1986. I was a student. I didn't speak French. I didn't have any friends. I ended up going to the movies two or three times a day, and in a three-month period, I saw 197 films, and my life was different <laughs> after that. And, I, and really, my relationship to French cinema has been has been consistent since that point. And so there was a lot of pleasure in sort of um, allowing French cinema to, to be a part of this process. It always is for me. I mean, filmmakers like Chantal Ackerman or, or Jean Eustache, you're having a yep. retrospective, or Maurice Piala specifically, um, was Maurice Piala, my cinematographer, um, Jose Dehaille at some point said, Maurice is the monster in the room for us because his, his, his um, for me, he's a filmmaker that I can never kind of get away from. I'm always somehow in conversation with him. So French cinema has meant a lot to me, and I've also had uh, a lot of different kinds of experiences in Paris. I've had relationships, I've had breakups, I've had sex, I've, I've cried in Paris, and I feel very comfortable there in a way that I, there's not many other cities that I would say that about. And I think, it, the Mer- America is the same as this, but we're always fascinated by kind of certification. And over here, the UK, we definitely have a tendency to allow a wider audience to see stuff that is violent or sort of horrific or psychological. But when it comes to anything that involves something that's sexual or kind of natural, in inverted commas, we have a tendency to regulate against it. Mm. And in America, this had, I think, initially an NC-17, didn't it, which is a kind of kiss of death rating in a sense. Um, or maybe not. I mean, I mean it, may, it may work for you in some respects, but did, did you have strong feelings about the way that it was received? Uh, you know, it didn't affect the film. I'm, uh, the film is distributed in the U.S. as it is here by Mubi, and um, they're a company that there wasn't a second in which anyone questioned whether or not we would release the film as it was made. Um, as I said, it, it was made as a film uh, that liberty was really important, and it's, it's in every frame. There was nothing to cut. Um, so I didn't really feel affected by it. It didn't affect the movie I made, but I think those kinds of um, moments of censorship are really impactful. They're impactful economically, certainly. They do limit a certain number of theaters, but they are also impactful because they're kind of warning shot to other artists and other filmmakers that be careful what you make because you can and will be punished with certain images. So for me, that's really um, what's at stake in something like that. There's also a question, why do these why do these sort of um, censorship sort of sets of, of, of issues, why do, why do they still exist? Why do these boards yeah. exist? And I don't, I, I'm trying to figure out who makes money on it. That's the only thing I can understand of why it still exists. So I guess if, if, if somebody's paid to watch the films, somebody <laughs> wants to pay to watch them should be able to too, shouldn't they? I guess so. that doesn't seem like enough money. I mean, there, I, I feel like there must be some, I mean, and there's clearly, this is, in America, it's the tr- history of the Hays Code, which was established in the late yeah. 1920s, and it was established by the Catholic Church, and somehow it's just stuck. But I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's uh, limiting, certainly. And I think actually the issue, which is, I think, kind of interesting is, is I don't, I think it's that the sex scene, particularly the one between um, Martin and Tomas, is, is too long for the censors. That's really, the, it's too long, which means it's too real. And, and, and also, you know, I don't want to, sort of to dwell on that sort of stuff, because there was so much other stuff in the film to, you know, to enjoy. I mean, I, the scene between the parents, and you were talking about costume before, but you know, with the crop top mm. when, when he walks in. I mean, that's such an uncomfortable scene. Mm. But when, when you're making a scene like that, is, is it nice to something that kind of breaks the ice in the other way, in a sense? I mean, I, I mean, well, I, I didn't know I'd made a comedy until we started screening <laughs> the movie. <laughs> <laughs> 
at all. Um, it was, but I, I enjoy that because I think, like, like Ozu, you know, I think humor is, is like a sense of humor about life is really important to, to art. So I'm happy to, to, to feel that. I think, I think the humor in the film is also that people are watching um, people, particularly Tomas, kind of break the norms. Um, he's a bit like yeah. Travis Bickle and, and Buster Keaton somehow combined. Like he's doing things that he should not do, which I think gives pleasure to people watching him. Um, that scene, uh, you know, I think for me, costumes and wardrobe can be considered a kind of prop, and prop in drama is a story. Yeah. So I, I remember the moment when we um, were deciding, Hadija's a guy, my costume designer and I, like what he was going to wear um, when he went to, to see Martin and kind of seduce his, his ex-lover, and we that was a women's top, and, I, and, sh and the costume designer thought, oh, we'll put a sweater over it, and I said, well, that's Franz Rogowski. Like, we don't have to do that. Like, we, we can, you know, we can, we can accentuate skin, let's say. And, um, and then I realized as soon as we put it on him, because I was looking at the chart, that the next scene he'd be in would be in with the parents, and it was very, it was like a piece of construction, um, which is how do the clothes work to tell the story? I guess it, it's, it connects in a way to my own life in the sense that my life looks a bit like that in terms of being multinational, multilingual. My husband's Ecuadorian, my co-writer's Brazilian, my producer's Tunisian, my f editor's French. You know, so uh, I've, I've made films that starred a Chilean woman, a Danish man, a Vietnamese guy. You know, so I've, I've lived in a multilingual um, world both creatively and personally so I, I didn't think about it I more thought about those people I was just really connected to the three actors that I cast in a way that made me feel that they would be connected to each other um, conveniently and I think it would have been a problem and I don't think I would have done it neither Ben or Franz speak French so there was never a moment when I had to think, is this movie going to be in French? And because that wouldn't have been good for anybody, um, particularly <laughs> me, because my French isn't good enough to, to kind of be the dominant language of the piece of art that I was making. So it felt very natural um, to be in those multiple languages. It's interesting. I'm, I'm sort of thinking about like certain things for me in this film, sexuality and sexual identity disappeared in a way that un was unexpected to me. I thought there would be a moment where the, the audience had to kind of come around to the guy, <coughs> idea that a gay guy was having sex with a woman, and that, but that doesn't exist in the movie, and that's because of generationally, it doesn't exist for these characters or these, these actors in a certain way. And that's a big change from when I was younger, uh, or, or in my life. If I suddenly, having been married to a man for 17 years, was <laughs> with a woman, everyone would be like, wow, that's really surprising. But that doesn't happen here. And I think similarly, like questions of, of like <coughs> one, one language, one culture, don't really seem that prevalent in the movie. Um, though those differences exist, and I think Agat's English particularly is in a way a sign of her vulnerability, because it's not as strong as the others. And, and there's a way in which she, she has she is a vulnerable presence. She's not, the actress is so strong. That's the interesting tension, is she has these vulnerabilities, but she plays also towards her power. Well, I think it's in the script. Um, I think he, he uh, he's someone driven by his own desires, and in a way, the tension of the script is the gap between what he has and what he wants. And that part was very personal to me, also in the pandemic, a sense that like what I wanted was a lot and what I could have felt very little. But I also felt like I was a person of privilege. And, and why do I want more? Why should I have more? So the question of why a man like Tomas should and believes that he deserves more is interesting to me. Um, you know, I'd say 97% of what he's doing is written in the script. So it begins with what's on the page. And there was a certain point in which Franz said, are you sure this is OK to me? And, and I, uh, you know, you think about the history of film. And specifically, I showed him movies, um, James Cagney movies, movies like White Heat and uh, The Public Enemy, um, which in which James Cagney in these 1930s films is playing a total sociopath. 
but he's he's great at it and and he is super appealing as a person it's important that there is a gap between the performer and the character if this was a documentary it would be a very different kind of film um, but it's it's you're watching someone almost perform a kind of vaudeville of a certain kind of man and I think Franz is actually I don't I mean I'm trying to think if this is significant to your experience of it he's a wonderful wonderful person and I wonder if that comes through because I loved him I just really loved him and I think that does come through he, he had a bike in the film it just didn't end the film um, the way that, that, that the last scene um, is constructed now um, to me, the bike, there's actually a wonderful movie to, called Taxi Zoom Klo, um, made in 1981, uh, a German film directed by a man named Frank Riplow who stars in the film. It's also a very sexually explicit film, and I watched it many times as like permission um, for the kinds of images. I, I felt the same about Chantal Ackerman's Je Tu Il Elle, which is a film that says, yes, you can shoot people making love like it's okay and sometimes I needed to do that one of the things in Taxi Zoom Clo is it's a it's it's a it's a very active central character but um, there are these scenes um, along the way which is the character in a car it, driving through Berlin and I, what I noticed is that they give the the audience a moment in which you are allowed to be with the character alone right and besides that you're never it's always relationship relatable or whatever the word is um, and so for me the bike does become a moment of kind of, of of reverie for the audience and for the character to see like just just a, a second when you're allowed into some idea of the interior one of the things cinema does incredibly well is you can watch someone be alone like that's a great um, paradox but cinema can do that and so uh, I guess I tried to take pleasure in that possibility well, that is all we have time for, I'm afraid. Um, I just want to thank our friends at Movie who have allowed us to have this advanced screen. It's going to be released a week on Friday, so um, do go and see it again and tell everybody about it. But a big, big thank you to Arasak. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.